Thank you, Masters of Ceremony. Uh, good afternoon. You are most welcome to the Uganda Museum. And uh, we are the Department of Museums and Monuments under the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities. And we are glad to host you, the children of independence, at this, uh, at this time when we, uh, we, we have this theme, the Uganda at 60 National History Exhibition. And we are really uh, anxious, are we not anxious, no. We are, we, we are just waiting because we know that what we are going to learn from you is an addition from what we had yesterday from your parents. And we know that as we have these things projected and uh, as we document these stories, our children and grandchildren, this being a repository of the national history, we think that we should be able to uh, have the, the stories uh, had by generations and generations and generations to come. With that, I will come you to this place and I hand over to the Masters of Ceremony. Thank you once again. Um, that was Jackie Nyirakiza, our host at the museum. And we thank you so much for keeping this repository of uh, the great works uh, of this country, the history and culture of this country so well uh, for the future generations to see uh, and also to recollect some of those important memories uh, of the time. I know we are going to have a very interesting discussion uh, this afternoon. And uh, as I continue recognizing some of uh, the guests we have this afternoon, allow me also to recognize Buona Robert Kavushenga, you are around. Uh, I hope you brought a few things from Ojeo, uh, coffee, bananas, and everything. But as you all know, Bwana Kavshenga was really uh, at the helm of our media houses, and he still continues to uh, contribute greatly uh, in the media industry, though he diversified now, and uh, also moved into farming as well. I've also seen another uh, media personality, uh, Dr. Spire St. Hong, Chief. <laughs> Chief, uh, your, your dramatic uh, representations of certain scenarios here <laughs> are quite interesting. Uh, but uh, I know you're also heading the Department of Philosophy. I, handle, I wonder how you combine that with art. <laughs> You combine that very well with art. Uh, Dr. Kanakwa, you're most welcome. Uh, these are the people who are helping us uh, join this uh, uh, exhibition quite well. And uh, we thank you for your participation and that specifically of Makere University uh, that is here. Before we continue on to the panel discussion, the next item uh, that I would like to deal with here is to invite uh, a professor who is also a great friend of this country uh, and has helped us digitize, archive most of this history, and more specifically, this particular history we are dealing with, Professor Derek uh, Patterson. Uh, Peterson, the English, uh, yes, you're most welcome. Yesterday, His Excellency called me Patterson, I think, so <laughs> there we are. <laughs> It's all right. Uh, so first of all, thank you all very much for coming to this occasion. Some of you were also here yesterday when we launched the exhibition with His Excellency behind the building. Uh, this is a chance to have a somewhat lower key, less stressful, and I think probably more substantive conversation about the exhibition and about the events of 9th October 1962, seen from the vantage point of the long eye of history, which is what the, the panelists are going to allow us to do. Um, 
Dr. Chimba and I have been calling this the kids panel, I'm sorry, but it is, it is in fact true <laughs> that all of you are the children of very important people from the 60s. You all have of course gone on to do great things yourself, but in this context, you're, you're here because we want to learn from you about what it was like to be uh, in a political household in the 60s growing up in a time of great controversy, a time of great optimism, and also a time of great trauma. So the kind of, the, the ways that the debates of the 60s were refracted into family life is the, is the subject, I think, of today's panel. I hope you've all had a chance to look through the exhibition, um, and I, all of us who were involved in curating it are happy to take any person who wants to take any uh, issue with any part of the exhibition and discuss it with us. Uh, let me make sure that you know who we are, because uh, we've missed, Dr. Kanakwa and I are two of the four curators. The others are Dr. Uh, David Ngendo Chimba from uh, Uganda Martyrs University and Dr. Edgar Taylor from the History Department at Makeda Day. Uh, all four of us have contributed to the making of this, this exhibition. The way we've set it up, if you've gone through it, is to contrast on the one hand, the public face of independence and the events of 9th October 1962 with um, the inside story, as it were, or the sort of hidden arguments or debates that took place outside Marlborough House in London, largely, and that shaped the way Ugandan politics worked in the provinces. So the, the kind of conceit, the organizing idea around the exhibition is to say that while the authorities in Kampala engineered a decorous handover of power from the British to uh, Milton Obote's government. In fact, outside Kampala, there was a lot of argument happening. So as you go through the exhibition, you'll see that we focused on people who felt disenfranchised, marginalized, uh, shunted aside, or even silenced by the events around October 1962. And it's that tension that we want you, I hope, to, to recognize. The hall is set up to give you outside the door a picture of how arguments took place largely in Kampala. As you go in, you get uh, stories about people who you won't have heard of, at least most of you won't have heard of, unless you've studied history at Makeda Day or at UMU. Uh, instead, you'll be learning about the Banya de Runzururu in uh, the Ruanzori Mountains. You'll be learning about the UNM and the kind of lower class activists who were pushing against Asian dominance in Kampala's economy. You'll learn about the history of DP, uh, and its political ideas. It, so, you know, it, how you read the exhibition will be up to you. All of you will find different ways through the hall and learn different things from it. Uh, as curators, we, we're not going to tell you what to take away, but we do want you um, to take seriously the idea that, that 9th October 1962 was not a victory for everyone, and that acknowledging that is probably the starting place for understanding what the relevance of this exhibition can be for politics today. But that's, that's a question perhaps for our curator, for our panel to pursue. So with that as a brief comment, um, let me give the microphone back to our distinguished Master of Ceremonies to push us into the next stage here. Thank you so much, Derek, uh, for setting the stage and uh, allowing us to understand the importance and uh, what we are about to experience, especially through our distinguished panelists. I think uh, we are at that stage now, very anxious to listen in to the panelists, and uh, I want to invite Madame Rachel Takali uh, from the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, who will be engaging the panelists uh, to come forward and uh, engage the panel. Madame Rachel, you're most welcome. Welcome everyone uh, to this very important occasion in relation to um, our 60 years of independence. And I'd like to take this opportunity to invite one by one uh, our panelists for this afternoon, uh, beginning with Mr. Jimmy Akena. Uh, please take your seat. <laughs> Followed by Ambassador Maurice Jiwanuka. Please take your seat also. 
followed by Mr. David Mbanga. You're welcome. And lastly, but not least, Mr. Osman Mayanja. Thank you for joining us, all of you, uh, all of those who have made this possible. My name is Rachel Chakali, and I'm coming from Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. I will be your moderator for this afternoon. But first of all, please allow me to acknowledge the efforts um, of a number of organizations that have worked tirelessly to make this day a success. Um, first of all, um, the Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, also by extension, Uganda Museum. Also, Makere University. Uganda Matters University. The University of Michigan. I believe those are all the organizations uh, that are directly responsible for this panel discussion success. To begin with, panelists, I welcome you once more, as well as the audience that is uh, with us this afternoon. I'd like to hear from them, first of all, what their experience was, because we know that they, were all, they are all children of important uh, political figures of the time. We're talking about the 60s. But first, I'd like them to introduce themselves beginning with Mr. Akena, to my immediate left. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. My name is uh, Jimmy Akena. I need to make a small disclaimer here in that um, I was born in the Republic. So that is 67. Um, um, so the exact independence period and whatever, I was actually not, not quite there. But. Um, I think it's important because the, the, as we're covering the period around independence, we can share our experiences, but um, I am slightly later, so I can call myself a Republican. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Ambassador Morris Kajim Chuanuka. I'm the son of, one of the sons of the late Benedict Chuanuka, the late Chief Justice, uh, who was murdered by Ida Amin. I've uh, been a minister for economic monitoring. I was a member of parliament for Common Simbi. And then I was in the CA. And I was a permanent representative in Geneva, the United Nations, and then in Abuja. And uh, now I stood, but I was not very fortunate this time. And so now I'm private business, then hoping to see what the future will hold. I was also born in 1961, uh, just said when uh, my father was, uh, has just become the chief minister and was coming from Lancaster House at that time. So as we grew up, of course, it has been politics, politics, politics only. And though he died young, when we were young, our mother carried on telling us what happened. Okay, the rest. I will come later. Thank you. Maybe I introduce my. I, I had two sisters who came, but I can see one. I don't know the other one. Where one is there? She's a old. It's called Melda Chwanka. I hear the other one has a hidden herself. It's called a Gina. Okay. When she comes, we shall see.
Thank you very much. My name is David Mpanga. I'm a lawyer by profession. Um, I'm the son of the late Frederick, Andrew Frederick Mpanga and uh, Joyce Mpanga. Um, Andrew Frederick Mpanga was the Attorney General of the Buganda Kingdom between 1961 and 1966. Uh, my mother was the first woman member of the Legico uh, and in subsequent uh, events, uh, one of the people that um, became exiled together with my dad from 1966. Uh, like Honorable Jimmy, I am not exactly a child of independence. I was born in 1970. Uh, so I can speak about the aftermath. Um, I was also just thinking about the, the, the way it kind of fades this way. That our two colleagues there are, are the ones in active politics. Uh, this, it, it becomes more private sector as you go this way. So I still have some public role. I work uh, as the Minister of Special Duties in the Kingdom of Buganda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Uthman Mayanja. I am an accountant by profession. I am the son of the late Abu Bakari Kashama Mayanja, who was um, the founding Secretary General of the Uganda National Congress and subsequently Minister in the Kabaka's government from around about 1959 until around about the time of the Republican declaration. Um, as David has said, not in active, in active politics, but certainly looking forward to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, our panelists. And as you see, or as you've heard, um, we were very much in the mix when it comes to how the independence era unfolded and the aftermath. They were very young, of course, but there's some things that they surely recall about family life in the um, immediate vicinity of these public figures as uh, they've been introduced. Beginning with you, Mr. Akena, uh, what do you recall concerning the role of your father in uh, independence politics and in the era that followed? I would like to take this opportunity to thank the exhibitors for making this um, um, the, 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 the items which are there because it gives some context. And I greatly appreciate it from the point of view of when Uganda was going into independence, we were not as one country. And I think some of it came out quite clear in the display which is there. And that um, it was not something which brought everyone together and aspiring for the same thing. There were a lot of concerns with different communities and it is out of that we needed to forge a nation. So um, from my perspective, I really um, appreciate the roles which were played in giving birth to the nation because at least we can all consider ourselves Ugandans. It's, that question seems to have been answered, although with some ups and downs, we have reached a stage of identifying ourselves as Ugandans. Of course, there are other elements which need to be done um, to make it more real, but from my perspective, I think that is the greatest appreciation I'd like to give to um, my late father and those who played an active role, that they were able to bequeath to us a nation which as part of this generation, we, we, this is the nation which we have. How we take it forward is going to be the task which we, we need to embark on. So I think that from my point of view, that is my greatest appreciation around the independence question. Thank you. Ambassador Chiwanuka, um, you also have your own personal recollections concerning what the contributions were that your father made to the independence era, um, they are unique for each individual. Please tell us what yours are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, before I say something, I should 
uh, introduce this book. It was written by a colleague of Dr. Taylor and a student of Dr. Patterson. Uh, I not uh, there. He was not able to to be around, and uh, we had invited him for the judiciary the memorial lecture. I asked the, the judiciary to launch this book, but I think when they read it through, it was mainly political. Uh, it doesn't cover the aspect of the judiciary, uh, our father vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary. So, but uh, Dr. Patterson said that they have now archived all the judicial archives. So I will ask Dr. R maybe to write another book, <laughs> which I agree, which uh, you know includes that part, and maybe also. I feel this book did not uh, uh, tackle very well the issue of Mengo. Uh, you know, the relationship between uh, Chiwanuka and Mengo, that was very key. I think he, he didn't give it good justice in this book. He needs to deep, I mean to dig deeper. Uh, I'm glad uh, my brother Kenna is around because if he had not been around, I've done, would have done a lot of, uh, you know, hammering to Dr. Milton Obote, but now that you are around, I will be a diplomat. <laughs> so, <laughs> I will remain a diplomat. Now, uh, no, 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 I can't speak freely. Uh, maybe next time. <laughs> um, actually, I'm sorry, I will not refer to him as my father, my father, and I can't refer to him as Bain. So I prefer saying Chiwanuka. I, well, in our culture, I don't call your father by name, but uh, you, I, I think you'll pardon me. And now, uh, when Ichwanka, there's few things he did, they may actually, which were big during his short period. Um, first of all, even before he became a prime minister or chief minister, he went to America, the United States, and got 300 scholarships. You can imagine, 300 scholarships. Tom Mboya also got those scholarships, and the, those are the scholarships, one of which he gave to the father of Obama. So that was the period. And uh, he gave the scholarships equally, 100 to Catholics, 100 Protestants, 100 to the Muslims. But the Muslims boycotted them. They said Chwanka wants to, you know, to convert us to Catholicism. So they, they boycotted the scholarships. Only 20 went. Those include Jumba Masagazi, the former minister of Amin, the Israeli Musoke, who was an ambassador and a minister in the Mengo, and uh, others. Among another thing which he did, he increased the price of coffee. And uh, people were confused. They would go. But at that time, the prices of coffee were, were determined by the Indians, and they would give any price. But now, when he, he came to power, he, he, he stabilized the price of coffee and it was one shilling, 50 cents. Now, people used to take back that money. said, you have given me too much, you see. So they say, hey, but this is too much money. And uh, but they, were ex they explained to them, no, this is your money, which one has increased the price uh, of coffee. And those are the days when people started building iron sheets and also building, you know, buying these uh, motorcycles which are called Mwanyi Zabala that the coffee, you know, boomed, uh, the coffee, you know. So, and then he increased the salaries of civil servants. Imagine it was a very short time in power. Of course, when Dr. Botter came, he slashed the price of coffee and it went back to the water. I'm sorry for that. And another thing, uh, you know, independence was not, uh, for some of us, it, you know, you, you heard yesterday when people say they irritated, they jubilated, what? People looked forward to an independence where there would be happiness. But I think the reverse was true. Uh, you know, when Dr. Bote came, uh, he put in prison, he imprisoned, you know, my father was put in prison. And, uh, you know, when he came out after the coup, I mean, he gave him the chief justice post, and then later I killed him. You know, it has not been, you know, a, a good period for some of us. Actually, uh, where some of us feel that really we started having some life was then President Museveni came to power. And, uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so that's when we got some relief. Otherwise, it was a kind of a persecution from the beginning. 
And uh, of course, uh, my father was a uh, Chiwanuka was, uh, uh, you know, was advised to run away from Amin, but he refused. Um, maybe yeah, that will be uh, in case a question comes on that. So he died, doesn't matter, and now we are trying to have him canonized. You see, in the Catholic Church, we believe in canonization of saints because it was a matter of justice. He stood uh, for that man who was imprisoned. Uh, just briefly, I don't want to monopolize. What happened? Um, there was a case of Stuart. He was arrested. I mean, arrested that man, and he wanted to hold the British at ransom. But then the Chuanuka, what he did, he, all the judges feared that case, but for him he went ahead and uh, he released the man. This infuriated Amin. It was the last straw that broke his back, broke, uh, the last straw that broke the horse's back. Because Amin had wanted to kill him, of course, for a year. Uh, I will not go into that unless I'm asked. But the last is true. So when he was arrested, Amin told him, I mean, President Kenyatta rang him and he said, you are the one who has arrested the Chief Justice. It is the Chief Justice. So Amin concocted a, a, a something, a, a statement that the Tanzanians had kidnapped me, but then President Amin, because he's a daring president, he has rescued me. Shwanuka refused to sign it. So he called, he sent for him at night there in uh, Nakasero. He said, don't you know I can kill you? Why don't you sign? He said, you kill me, I will not sign it. I cannot tell lies. So he shot him twice in the head, you know. So we are trying to look for the body and we know that the biggest identity will be a shot, a hole here in the skull. I thank you very much. So it has not been good news for some of us. Um, Mr. Mpanga, before you come in, um, of course it will not be a, a very strange realization that Uganda's history has had its own uh, very checkered uh, sort of turns in the road. But we are working to move forward. Uh, Mr. Mpanga, yours is a unique, if not interesting, uh, fact that the parent that you, you will be talking about is a woman. Uh, the panelists here uh, are talking about their fathers. Yours is a little different. Tell us how she struck you uh, from a political point of view in an era when women were not particularly active in politics. How was it for you? Um, thank you very much. And may I also start, like my colleagues, by thanking the organizers for inviting us for this very uh, interesting discussion. Um, I was a little challenged when I heard that the discussion was to be held in a museum. I wasn't sure you know, what kind of display would be put under. And then earlier when the MC was talking about the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, I asked my co-panelists quietly which, which section they thought that we fall under. Is it tourism, are we wildlife, <laughs> or perhaps antiquities? Um, but it brings me to a point that's a favorite of mine um, in answer to your question, madam, that um, history is not dead. Um, history is with us. I think it's William Faulkner who said the past is never dead. It's not even past. Um, you don't grow up l thinking you're living in the house of a political actor. You grow up in the home of your mother or your father, or you know, your father or mother. Um, and they're just your parents. And different people's parents, different children's parents do different things. Um, and some wash their hands before they go to eat their food, some eat, wash their hands after they've eaten. Um, some are Christian, others are Muslim, others. So you, you grow up in a context where, you know, you're just a child in a home and you think this is normal. It's really only when you grow up and that you realize that perhaps your upbringing was different for one reason or another, because of what your parents did, you know, where you lived, what you, you know, professed uh, by way of religion, etc. So I, I can't say really that as a child I was conscious that I was growing up in a political actor's home. But I know that politics was front and center of every conversation um, in our home. Um, and of course, the more cognizant uh, parts of my life start in Idi Amin, 
um, and politics was whispered. Uh, and we were told, don't repeat this at school. Um, you know, because the thing, as I was saying to uh, Honorable Jimmy, we were talking about the child of someone, that uh, the things that are whispered at home are screamed out loud, uh, outside by the children. So the children were always told, don't, Robert, why are you laughing? <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't say this at school, was frequently uh, an admonition when something was said about Idi Amin or something was said. Um, uh, my father, uh, late father, my father died in 1976, but my father was very close to Mutesa. And of course, again, mention of Mutesa or profession of love of Mutesa was, was prohibited, was, was something that was clandestine. So again, I grew up understanding politics, being interested in politics, but thinking of politics as some kind of, something that was whispered and or spoken to uh, on the basis of, you know, once I agree with, if I know that this is an, an agreeable person, then we can exchange that. Um, I know then subsequently we're dealing with, you know, immediate post-independence, but um, certainly as I grew older, um, we got into the 80s. Uh, I remember the 1980 election. I remember the post-1980 uh, election uh, lack of consensus and what happened. If we're in the museum, we're debating using big words, consensus. Um, and again, my mother's role in trying to bring, say, the DP, CP, UPM into a coalition, uh, the meetings that were held, the first time I ever saw uh, President Museveni was at my home. Um, my mom's written about this so I can talk about it. I snuck back from school. She'd said stay at school and don't come back at lunchtime. Uh, my father had died and I thought my mom might be having an affair with somebody who might become a stepfather. So I, got, I snuck back, I snuck away from school at lunchtime, essentially to come and catch my mother. Uh, and I found, <laughs> you have to wonder what I'd have done if I'd found her, well. But anyway, I found lots of cars. I found Professor, uh, the late Dr. Chiseka, my late uncle Kanyerezi, uh, Mayanja and Kanji, these are people I knew. And some other people now whom I didn't know, but who I now know to be President Museveni, uh, Eria Kategaya, and others. Um, so politics was very much um, something that happened in my home. Um, and politics, as I've come to learn and eventually even write about, is something that affects us, whether we pay attention to it or not. So, um, you know, in that sense, being raised by a politician or a political actor um, made me conscious of the fact that we need to be interested in politics because regardless of whether we're interested in it or not, it takes a great interest in us and shapes us one way or another. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uthman Mayanja, uh, your late father was a fine mix. He wasn't just a politician, he was also a lawyer and a civil servant. He, he morphed into these different roles. What are your earliest impressions of your father, the politician, the lawyer? the civil servant. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> dif always difficult to speak after the OHT was spoken. Um, so bear with me. Um, I, I think for me, every time I try to think about that early period, I am impressed by the courage. Uh, I'm impressed by the resourcefulness, by the ambition, and the drive of the early independence uh, movement in Uganda. Uh, my own father was born of very humble uh, peasant origins, uh, managed to get into King's College Buddha purely out of his um, academic prowess. And um, very quickly, however, stamped his, himself onto the scene his very, fact, very first act of protest against the Her Majesty's government was at Budo itself, when, she, when he protested or we, together with others why the picture or the portrait of the colonial governor was above the picture of the Kabaka. 
Um, and this is somebody that was on scholarship. This is somebody that was quite often have, having to explain himself in terms of um, unpaid dues and that sort of thing. Um, he later went on to Makere and it's, it's well documented. The protest that was led at Makere against, it was seen as a food protest, but it was really an, an, an anti-discrimination, an anti-racist um, protest um, that was then the base of him being forced out of university. It was really college, but we call it university nevertheless. Um, given the option to return, um, if he did in fact apologize and so on and so forth and, and declined that and you know went out on the street and this was during a period when he had actually also had already at that time co-founded the Uganda National Congress together with the late Musaz. So I think for me that is the boldness, the ambition. Um, we, we, we have been raised, funny enough, to uh, hold uh, the white man in awe uh, and there they were, these peasants that only put on shoes a few years ago, standing up to them um, and, and matching them in terms of intellectual argument uh, and making bold demands um, in a period that one can only imagine what sort of information did they have, what sort of knowledge did they have, what was the basis of this courage, um, is it, are some of the questions that, um, that come to my mind. Um, the history of his then, you know, education in, in the UK and the United Kingdom is another paradox, uh, but it was interesting to see how the British were able to deal with their adversaries because he was by then an adversary of the colonial administration, uh, during which period of time again, uh, oddly enough, my father went to Cambridge in 1952-53, the Kabaka was deposed, uh, forced into exile around the same time, and I'm, I'm aware that uh, the late Mpanga, the late Chuanuka, were amongst those that were in the United Kingdom at the same time, and therefore were able to provide tremendous support and linkage with the Kabaka whilst in exile, which was another paradox of the decision of the colonial government at the time. Um, and, and upon return to Uganda, so I think that early period pre-1952-53 was full of passion, it was full of hope and zeal, and I believe idealism. And I think the return post completion of studies was then informed by a reality on the ground that was distorted in terms of the um, political organization being in disarray. It would appear that the actors at the time were very much focused, could see independence around the corner and perhaps had begun to jostle for, um, for power and position and, and along the way lost the ideals uh, of carrying the nation, of building a nation, um, of, of, of cohesion within their own political structures, um, and, and that then speaks to some of the things that Honorable Aken has spoken to in terms of did we have a nation pre-independence? What were the big issues that needed to be resolved from a political standpoint? So I think, like um, Ambassador Chiwanuka, there was, uh, on the eve of independence, a disappointment, I believe, around the political realities on the ground, um, which then informed the, the turmoil that we saw pre-independence, um, and perhaps also then the later uh, upheaval that then arose post-independence. Um, so I think in terms of contribution, for me, I, I go back to the point that uh, this independence was was fought for and delivered by men that were quite young, uh, quite inexperienced, but nevertheless, um, they used the tools at their disposal. Um, they were not held back by boundaries of, of race or tribe or religion or nationality. Uh, they took the fight for independence outside the borders of, the, of this country. Um, particularly the period of, uh, of the mid-50s. My late father, together with uh, the likes of Chiwanuka, were very vocal in the British press uh, and made the British very uncomfortable about their own position in the colonies, uh, exposing the double standards, because obviously the story sold to the British that we're being kind to the African, we're civilizing them and we're helping them, and we're able to actually undo all of that work 
through the activism that they uh, undertook, quite often at the expense of the studies that took them to the United Kingdom. Uh, but for me, that is, that is fundamentally uh, inspiring. And of course, when you compare that to what's happening today, it's a very, it's a very um, sobering uh, reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to find out what could have made the difference between the way you view politics as panelists, um, your participation or lack thereof. Could it have been a case of insulation? Were you insulated from politics, for example, Mr. Akena? Um, were you served politics morning, noon, and evening? Uh, while the other panelists are not active politicians, as we know politics to be, Mr. Kenna, you've gone the other way. What made the difference? Um, was politics actively encouraged in your household? Or were you kept apart from it and you chose in the end to go that way anyway? Thank you for that. To tell the truth, I try to run away from politics. And that is because my first coherent remembrance of life centers around the coup of 1971. That's really where my memory starts from. And um, it was very vivid. Um, I remember the tank in front of the house. Um, the, our place in Kololo had a small chain link fence. So the tank was moving up and down, they're moving the turret. The, 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 it, it, the, all of that made me want to run away from the politics. But the home I grew up in was consistently, there was a lot of politics cons constantly. There were people from all walks of life and all parts of Uganda. So. As I grew up, I had um, uncles, for example, the late uh, Mutoera, the father of Mogisha Muntu, was one of the uncles I grew up with, and I, I knew him as an uncle throughout. And I had very many close people, including leaders from other um, countries like um, Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda, who these were uncles whom I formed, the, the, you can say like the structure around the home. So I, could, I was not away from politics, but I did not want to get involved in politics because I saw the, the negative side. Um, most of my early life I spent in exile, but that um, the getting involved was, in my case, really came much later. And this was again after the second coup of 1985. In those days, soon after the coup, any magazine, any news story which you would read about, it had the dictators Milton Obote and Idi Amin. Dictator Milton Obote, Idi Amin. At that stage, I was in my um, 17, 18 years old, and I started asking what exactly was this about? So I had to find out for myself investigate for myself and satisfy myself. Um, the father who I knew, who I, I, I loved, the sort of things which were being attributed to him did not make sense. And the more I investigated, the more I loved what he did. And this one, <clears throat> this one came about because independence, the way he described independence was the colonial government as a child, he described it in the simple form as that it's like this loaf of bread which is made in Uganda. The Ugandan wants it for the old woman in Uganda, but the colonialist wants it for the old woman in UK. So the task was how do we get this bread and serve the old woman in Uganda? And that was the, the earlier stage how we described it to us as kids when we were very young. But when you follow it up, it was how do we get the economy of Uganda and the benefits of Uganda to work for the citizens of Uganda? The initial colonial state, everything, in fact, the growth of 
um, coffee was to serve um, Britain. Cotton, everything was going to Britain. So that was the struggle for independence. Now, at independence, one of the first things they did was to expand the education system. Of course, the education system was geared to train people who could serve the colonial administration. But there was an important issue of expanding. And there, I think very few people can dispute that UPC government expanded. Even the traditional schools were given conditionalities that to receive government funds, you must open up to any, any capable citizen, irrespective of um, religion or the like. And there was also a deliberate effort to mix up the country in that um, if you, wherever you came from, you'll you, you find a generation where somebody came from one corner of the country and studied in another corner. And that was deliberate to try and build the nation. So initially, I didn't want anything to do with politics. But each time I moved away, I, I kept on coming back. And when I went into the facts, and this is one of the questions which, um, when I started getting active, it's one of the first questions I put on one of the, in those days, the internet forums, was, does anybody know any constitutional article or law, any dictatorial constitutional article or law enacted by UPC? Um, David may take me to, uh, sorry, David may take me to task later on this one, but the point I was making is that the 1967 Constitution did not outlaw multipartism. And even the 1980 elections, which people have talked about, were held under the 67 Constitution, which allowed for multipartism. I do recognize the conflict with the kingdoms, and I think that started long before the UPC government came, which is well laid out in the display, which is here. But UPC, when they had the opportunity, to write a constitution did not put in what other people have done, remove the right of um, others to remain in their parties and to contest within those parties. Um, equivalent in the 1995 constitution was Article 269, which was a big issue for a lo long period of time until it was removed. So as I investigated, I found this something completely unique because when you go into Kenya, I think Kenya it was Article 2C, which made it a one-party state. In Zambia, it was 4A. All of the countries that went across Africa, you found that, the, like the independence parties or whatever parties, did make them one-party states. As far as UPC was concerned, UPC said, oh, I'm accused about the 66 and 67 constitution. In the 67 constitution, it allowed for multipartism. So, on the other aspects on the economy and trying to strengthen uh, or to improve the livelihoods of the citizens, I also ran comparisons. Um, what was the um, health coverage, pre-independence, post-independence, within the region, if you compare Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, what the UPC government was able to do was impressive. With the resources which are available was impressive. Um, the expansion of the cooperatives to be able to put money in the um, in the pockets of the citizenry was something which also drew me to it. And that is what now formed my desire to play an active role in politics, in that if we could do more of that one, we could have um, a better base. So um, much of that initially, my investigation was to satisfy myself. I found myself drawn in and have not been able to exit from the, from, from, from the politics. And I do hope that we can develop a consensus where we can coexist and find ways in which we can actually make the lives of our, um, our fellow citizens better. I think that is the ultimate goal of the politics, where we may have our disagreements at a leadership level, but we must be able to create an environment which will, be, will translate in a better conditions of living of the citizens of Uganda. I think that covers briefly why I'm in politics. Interesting. Uh, Ambassador Chiwanuka, you've shared a number of uh, the traumatic experiences uh, that you remember earlier on in relation to the political career of your father. How has that affected your view 
or willingness to participate or not participate in politics. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe, you know, for us politicians, sometimes we talk too much, so you may be forced to knock if I don't keep quiet in time. Um, Agreed. Thank you. When you see I'm going, because there is a lot, just you are tickling a tip of the iceberg. Now, before maybe I forget, this book is in Fountain Publishers. I don't know why they don't put it in Aristoc. Aristoc is where people know books are. So I appeal to Aris Fountain Publishers to put it in Aristoc. Uh, before I go to that, uh, uh, my brother here has said the things which have tickled me. And uh, I agree. The letter Gurawari said that uh, when you are driving and you keep looking in the mirror, you will get an accident. You must look forward. But if your eyes are fixed in the mirror. So I agree we should do not look at history and this did this happen. This, but usually sometimes the history helps us to make a good future. And uh, by the way, Dr. Bote built 24 hospitals. So I mentioned that. At least that's a credit. And, um, and they are the hospitals which are still standing today. They have not added actually others. And, but uh, on another note, you said that, okay, UPC allowed the freedom that people should remain in their parties. But uh, my brother, honorable, people were persecuted. For example, apart from the imprisonments, I remember a funny story in Bushenyi, that's where Dr. Bote came. Uh, uh, after the exile. So it was the uh, hero's day. That was, the, I think, May 27th. Now, that day, uh, Dr. Bot and UPC used to go and uh, you know, celebrate that day. In Bushenyi, buses used to pass from Lango, from Gulu, going to Bushenyi. Now, uh, whenever that function would come, the DPs there in the area would be arrested and put in prison for the period when Dr. Bottle would be around the cell. For maybe four days. So every year they would be in prison. Now what happened? These people used to take themselves to the police, you know. They said, now we, are, we have come because after you are going to come for us. And until the president heard of it, Dr. Bottle then he stopped it. So you can see the fear where, which was put in the people. Now, uh, before I, I, I answer your question, let me just to touch a few things. Because when these people talk, they tickle me. You know, the Baganda had a problem. You know, they didn't want anybody to be above the Kabaka. That was a very big problem. In fact, when they were, uh, they were elect going for the elections of the 1962, they were deceived that it was Kabaka going to replace Chiwanuka in Entebbe. That's, that's what had, they had in mind. That's why when they saw the union, the instruments of power being given Dr. Bote, they were so annoyed. They said, now what? For us, we thought it was the Kabaka. You see, that was a very big problem. And, you know, Chiwanuka failed to handle that problem because he was going to, he would have got to the Kabaka and explained the salary. You see, in Uganda at that time, you only needed to get one person, just the Kabaka only. And then the whole two million would follow. He failed in that. That's why when Dr. Bote agreed with the Kabaka, that was all. He didn't need to, you know, to campaign in Uganda. I think that's where Mzei failed. You know, he should have handled the king. You know, uh, more. You know, handled him. You see, uh, Nyerere said that when you run and you reach a junction, you know, when you have followers, wait for them because if you go, they will be lost when they come. Because for you, you can see far ahead, but then these people will be stuck when they reach the junction. So I think Chiwanuka was far ahead of his time. And he was not patient, you know, with these people in Mengo because for them, it is like court, it is an order. They don't compromise. I think they are afraid to handle. Knock, now, knock, knock, knock. You, are, you agreed that I should knock. Okay, I'm, I'm about to finish. Uh, before, uh, you, before you continue, mm. I'd like to know, uh, returning to the question, how do these experiences lead to where you are in the Yeah, terms? I'm coming to that. Uh, I'm coming to that. I'm, uh, uh, it's very interesting, okay, because you may stop at, and then say the time is up. So, I, and these things, you know, I want to say these two stories. Uh, uh, honorable, you are honorable for me, watch Tiba. Okay, called the Wichitiba. You know what happened? He, he, he reminded me something when he said people should join politics. You know, there was a, 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 there is a story. A rat, uh, you know, was giving a hard time to the, uh, to the boss of the house. 
because it was uh, making noise. And so what this man did, what the man did, he brought a, a trap and put a nut. So this uh, rat went to the cow and said, for you, you have a big toe. You, you touch the trap so that I can, it can release and then I can eat the what? The nut. Ah, the cow said, ah, for me, I'm not concerned. Who does that to do with me? No, it's not of my business. He said, if you don't do it, you are in trouble. He said, no, which trouble? So this one went to the chicken. He said, you chicken, you have a strong mouth. You touch the trap. And once the trap goes, I will take the oat, the, the, the nut. So if you don't do it, you, you are in trouble. He said, trouble? What, what trouble? There's nothing. So the, sorry, they, they left. So the poor rat was there. Now, as he was waiting, a, a, a snake came. And as it was wriggling, it was got by the trap and was hit, it was cut into two. So it was there, making noise, what, jumping. And then the old man thought that he had caught the, the rat, so he came. Now when he came, of course, he would not see there was a, this lamp called the Tadova, Munaku Tadova, this lamp, it's a, a weak lamp, you can't see properly. So now, in the process, the chicken, I mean the snake, beat him, you know, because the head was still working, so of the snake, so it beat him, and he died. Now, when he died, people came and they cried. You know, they cried and they buried. It. Now, uh, as they were going to bury, they, when the people came, these people went to the chicken and they said, "Now, me chicken, you see, people are here. They need breakfast. You know, what do we do?" So, as she was going to the slaughterhouse, the rat was saying, "Oh." I told you, Ooh. so he was there on the iron sheet. I told you a trouble was coming, and I didn't listen to me. Woo, the trouble was coming, you didn't listen to me. So after the burial, they said, okay, we are going to celebrate that funeral rite. So they went to the cow and said, now, Mr. Cow, you hear what is happening? We are going to... So what do you say? So as they were taking him to the slaughterhouse, he was crying. The rat said, Ooh, I told you, so he was there on the special. Ooh, I told you, Ooh. I told you the trouble is coming. Now, this, the rat and the chicken, I mean the cow, the, I mean the cow and the chicken, never knew that this thing would concern them. This is what, uh, you, actually, that's the question you are saying. That, uh, why do we join politics? You, sometimes you things happen, ah, those ones, you know, they will never happen to me. And then you are there. But then one day, things will return, and then you will be affected. So you, the better the earlier you join, so that you can spare it all day. Thank you for that roundabout explanation. But I think you've hit home. We all know where you're coming from. So you're actively in politics, in short, for purposes that you have explained for quite ably. Mr. Mpanga. Yes, ma'am. You've taken a path. I don't know if you see it as a political one or not. But the events surrounding uh, where your mother came from in political terms and where she is today, how would you say they have, would you say they've had an impact on how you view or participate in politics or not? Absolutely, because again, as I was, as I was saying in my earlier submission, it's, you don't realize that you're growing up in a politician's home. You just think you're home with your parents. But what they do, as Honorable Jimmy was saying, you know, the uncles or the aunties who come around, the people that, the conversations that are held shape you and shape your outlook on life. Um, so my mother's participation in politics uh, was capital P politics, but also small p politics. Um, and the small p politics, for example, was to do with the women's movement. Um, I'd say that a lot of uh, my view when I was looking at the ladies, uh, there's a part of the exhibition that concerns, uh, that brings out the women around independence. And I was like, oh, that's Auntie so and so, that's Auntie so and so, because these are people who used to come to my home, or, you know, to see my mother, to talk about uh, the women's movement as it were. Indeed, uh, in 1985, when the second coup, the July 1985 coup happened, my mother and uh, Mama Miriam had been to a women's conference, I think it was in Beijing or in Nairobi. Nairobi leading up to Beijing. Um, so my mother was always involved in the women's movement uh, aspect of things and that's something that you know, was at the forefront of my consciousness. Um, at the forefront of my consciousness was also the fact that the kingdom of Buganda had been abolished and Buganda wanted their king, we wanted our king. Um, and it was something that I knew I would see in my lifetime. I don't know how I was going to see it. But 
from the discussions that we had at home, it was something that was always going to happen again. Um, I also knew that politics was about service, and it should be about service, um, and should be about dealing with the basic needs of people, and making sure that people are happy and prosperous. Um, I think some of the things are then constructs of an adult mind. I don't want to be one of those people who makes a, a historical judgments about other people. It's very easy to sit here and think, you know, why did Obote do this? Why did Mutesa do the other? Why did you know, so-and-so say this? These people of this place or these people of that party were wrong. All of them were trying to do, I think, were trying to do the right thing the way they knew how. And many times they were fighting against forces which they didn't recognize, they didn't understand. Go further back in history, for example, and look at Mwanga, an 18-year-old king who was dealing with what he thought were rebellious pages. But what, what was in fact the advancement of a very large force coming in with Christianity at its kind of the, you know, it's the, the, the lubricant, lubricating end, if I may stop there with that uh, analogy, people's minds may go in a, in a terrible direction. But it was, you know, the one that was easing the entry of colonial, of imperialism, of, 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 of the colonialist phase of, of global imperialism. Come to independence, you have 35-year-old, 40-year-old actors, people who a lot, a lot of the time had not been involved in public administration, um, had limited ideas around sovereignty and what sovereignty meant in a global system that was different from the one their grandfathers, their forefathers, their forebears had been in, um, who were primed to believe that they understood or could understand these things if they went and studied Shakespeare or read law uh, at Cambridge. I'm not talking about anybody. Uh, or, or, you know, or Oxford, as my father did. You know, they, they, they were given an idea that this thing was simple. If you had a degree in sociology, in law, in journalism, if you did, you know, you, you knew how to debate, you understood sovereignty, and you could manage a state. Sadly, experience now shows me that actually maybe you couldn't. Um, and these were people who knew each other by name, first name and second name, went to the same schools or thereabouts, or certainly the same university, there was only one, generally spent a lot of time together um, in different places, well enough to at least be familiar with each other and know if someone was passing, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. But the politics of that time, as the politics of today, because the past is not dead, um, did not enable, that relationship did not enable them to escape uh, zero-sum politics, that either I have everything and you have nothing, uh, or I have to lock you up in order to shut you up, or I have to kill you, uh, or we have to resolve disputes violently. For me, my political journey has largely been in trying to get the thinking around that issue, uh, more main, mainstreaming the thinking that needs to get us away from that kind of negative politics. I have always wanted to foster and enable people to talk to each other, like we're doing here, to agree, dis to, to disagree agreeably, and always know that it's far better, you have far more in common with each other, and it's far better to deal with things in a way that doesn't completely close out anyone. Because nobody knows everything and nobody knows nothing. You need to have, um, an element of give and take in order for us to live together. We want the same things. Um, so again, to the organizers of this discussion, it's a very good one, and maybe we need to have many of this kind of discussion, uh, where we can have Bote's son sitting with, uh, with, with Chiwanuka's son, uh, you know, one would have hoped Mutesa's son, and you know, others. And you ask them, who's the happiest? You know, that's, that, that may be for Uganda at 100. He, he, he whispered. <laughs> it might be Uganda at 100 who will have that reckoning. But a reckoning around what, what, what was this really all about? Because you see, one of the biggest problems I perceive 
is that we, we discussed the personalities, the issues around which they were debating, but we, we often miss the bigger problem, the structure, that this uh, antagonism was largely driven by the structure. We were fighting to take over the management of a colonial construct. The DNA of that, that thing was a matter too. So, um, no matter how many times Ben drove it back and forth on the runway, and no matter how long the runway would be, it was a matter too and it would never fly. Uh, Obote would have the same challenge. Uh, any other actor would have had the same challenge of making it go back and forth. Will it fly? It will not fly if it's designed as a matter too. So if what we're looking for is a plane, we need to sit down and deconstruct this thing and think whether we can make it a plane. Um, and if we can't make it a plane, then maybe we need to sit down and agree how we're going to use the matter too. Um, and you know, whether it matters whether I'm sitting at the back or I'm sitting at the front, who will collect the money, how, will the, you know, how much it, will we pay, who will eat that money? So it's, it's only when we get into those structural, and they're sometimes very boring, or very, they seem very conceptual and, and far, you know, far removed from the issue. We will always come back, unfortunately, to this situation. Again, you know, as I finalize, and I don't want the knock-knock uh, that comes to uh, my brother, I was just thinking, oh, ev everyone here, leave alone the parents, everyone here was the victim of this problem. Jimmy's first memory is of trauma, military uh, attack on his home, exile. Uh, he comes back, he goes back into exile. Um, I didn't know Jimmy personally, but I, my first understanding of Jimmy was Jimmy with dreadlocks, growing dreadlocks because he was in exile um, and hoping that, you know, he'll only shed his dreadlocks when he comes back to Uganda. I don't know if he kept the locks, but, uh, um, you know, Jimmy suffered that. Your dad was killed. Uh, your dad was locked up before he was killed. Um, and these are men who died very young, in their 40s or 50s. Uh, my parents were in exile when I was born. Uh, my dad died after, the, after they came back from exile, but you know, my re various relatives were in exile at different times. Uh, my mother's father was, was buried alive um, after the 1966 event. His dad was um, locked up in, in the 60s. Uh, detention without trial. I remember when I was studying law, um, there was a case that went, went to the Privy Council. It's still a, 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 a sterling case on the Kelsenian, Kelsenian theory of revolution. Um, ex parte Matovu. And Matovu was the Pokino, the head of the, the chief of Buddu County, who was detained without trial in post-1966. Uh, detention without trial uh, was possible because habeas corpus, the right to habeas corpus had been removed in the 66-67 uh, constitution. So Abu Mayanja went to argue a case for habeas corpus, filed an application for habeas corpus for Matovu, um, relying on the habeas corpus article in the 1962 constitution. When he got to the court, the, the judge must have said, well, Mr. Mayanja, you cited the wrong article of the constitution because the constitution that we have doesn't have the right of habeas corpus. So Abu Mayanja, I'm sure, quite dramatically said, but no, my constitution, you know, when did the 62 constitution uh, cease to have a force? I have the constitution here. So then the dispute in that case that went all the way to the then Court of Appeal, last Court of Appeal of Uganda, was whether uh, uh, a constitution that has been abrogated outside the provisions of that particular constitution is binding or not. Of course, that's where law means politics, and politics always wins. Um, you know, you go out and read Ex parte Matovu. But the point I'm making is, all of us here, in one way or another, have seen this beast. Um, it's a terrible beast. It's a beast that you don't want to visit anybody else's home. It's a beast that you want to ensure that the children of the children of the independent, you know, the grandchildren of independence, shouldn't have to deal with these things. Let them deal with interest rates, commodity prices, uh, you know, the distance, you know, the, the density of... of, of you know, how many, how many patients per, per doctor do you have in the population, uh, class sizes, let them deal with those issues. But if we constantly have to deal with the, you know, these issues of you know, human rights, uh, am I entitled to uh, a different opinion, we, we, we can't move forward. And to my mind, that's the conversation that I would like to foster. And I don't need to be in you know, the stamina politics, I call it stamina, 
you know, you have to stand up and to sit in the mustamina, and you dance, and then you give out money, and you know, in order to get to parliament. Um, I think we, you know, that's still being captured by the, and I'm not denigrating my brothers who are in it. I think that's still being captured by the problem, the bigger problem that we have not resolved the structural issue. Let's resolve the structural issue, and then, you know, hopefully the politics will be better. Uh, this discussion is shaping up to be better than I had anticipated. Uh, do you agree? <laughs> um, something very important has come to the fore, and I'm hoping that um, someone out there would be in a position to actually internalize what is being said here today. Um, we have not given ourselves the opportunity as a country to actually visit the true nature of uh, the fix that Uganda has had these many years. Um, to hear the people who actually lived in close proximity to the most important, some of the more important actors in the independence era, to hear that they actually have been living and still living in pain it's an interesting revelation, to me at least. Because we tend to, to act as if these events that, that have, have been so well documented happen somewhere in, in space, as if they did not touch on individuals or personalities. But that is not the case. I think there is something here that, uh, as Mr. Mpanga has said, needs to be amplified at a, another level beyond this discussion point uh, that we find ourselves in. But going forward, uh, Mr. <laughs> Abu Mayanja, I'm sorry, Mr. Uthman Mayanja, on this very matter, as you watched your father in those formative years, there are some experiences he went through as a political actor that you may recall rather vividly. Has that meant anything to you in terms of whether or not you've engaged in political terms? Please tell us. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, ab absolutely, inevitably, th that has happened. Um, my father's early life, I think he dedicated himself to service very early on. Uh, as a young man at Budo, he, he had already decided um, that he would serve. Um, and and, and that, how he came to that conclusion, I'm not entirely sure. But I think it had been impressed upon him quite early on that he had a unique opportunity. Uh, sadly, and, and these are the things that David, I think, is speaking of, uh, purely because he was a Muslim. Um, and, and a lot of hope, it had been impressed upon him that a lot of hope um, had been vested in him and his education. Um, and, and again, that's, that's another long story. Um, and I think he did do that. He did um, set aside the opportunity to live a private life, a life of um, commerce, of uh, private law practice and this sort of thing. Uh, in, in an exchange in settled for public life. Um, and, I, and it was at great personal cost um, in terms of some of the things that, um, that have been spoken of. So the life of a politician is, is one that has no privacy in it. Uh, there is no end to where your life stops, rather where the public life stops and your private life begins. Uh, your home is... is, is um, is, is, is like a public, it's like a bus stop. People come in whenever they feel like, uh, with all sorts of issues. Um, and, and, but I think he was, he was entirely at home with that. Um, and, um, you know, he was a through and through politician. I think that's what I would say. Um, was politics in the home? I wouldn't, I don't have the, the sort of experiences um, that, that, that uh, my fellow panelists have described um, for, for perhaps different reasons. But I certainly knew him to be uh, all about politics, um, even though he did have some very um, 
some other interests that he did pursue, but certainly politics was one that consumed and took up his entire time, his, 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 his energy, and so on and so forth. But it was all about serving the people uh, and doing um, and, 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 and making them better. I think that's what it was all about. Um, my own, I made a decision as a young man not to be political, uh, not to be in active politics, because I, re I reckoned, um, and this is the early 90s, that the reason we're failing to have that conversation is because we are poor. Okay, so poverty has, and I think that is still true today, poverty has blocked us and our ability to engage, our ability to, to discuss. I mean, we're still in 2021 voting on the basis of 2,000 shillings. Okay, less than a dollar. And we will vote for a given politician. Um, our elected officials have been known to be bribed for what was then $2,000 for the 2005 constitutional amendments of late, just a bit more than $10,000 has been said to have been enough to sway public officials from taking decisions that are in the interests of those that elected them. So, so this poverty for me is, is really the big anathema. Uh, and, and that is why I chose a life that is more inclined towards commerce, with the hope that we can do things that can help people get out of, um, of, of this um, dependency um, and perhaps where we, we are, it's not, it's not a lack of intelligence. I think the average voter is, is well informed and, um, and, and, and quite aware and alive to the options that they have, but they make choices. And those choices are rational choices, uh, by the way, uh, in their context. But until we uplift the average standard of living, um, it will be difficult to, to get us to get to that point where we can have rational conversations. So today, when, an accident, when a car gets involved in an accident, um, the first responders, the ones that get onto the scene first, are more interested in separating the accident victims from their possessions than from giving them first aid, for example, um, and so on and so forth. So that has been my, my own personal attack around, around politics. It doesn't help that ultimately most politicians that I have observed, um, unfortunately, because the game of policy is long term, uh, there isn't a politician, whether it's Obama, whether it's Clinton, whether it's Bush, none of them can sit back and say, I actually achieved what I set out to achieve. Despite the immense resources available to them, uh, when you look back on it, it does look like, so what looked like a successful intervention in the Middle East now looks like a total shambles, for example. Uh, so the game of politics the, is, is, is one that ultimately does not give satisfaction. I don't believe that a politician can ever be entirely satisfied by, what, by their endeavor. Um, and I think it's, it's something that we have to go into, anybody going to politics must realize that, that it's very nature, they can never quite often, they can never quite be, say, we did succeed. Um, look at the greatest democracy, America today, it's in turmoil about basic principles, basic rights enshrined in the US Constitution. And that's the nature of politics, I suppose. Um, so speaking, perhaps, um, f but for me, and again, this is for me, the disappointment uh, for the Uganda project is that on the eve of independence, we were very clear about who our enemy was. And it was the colonial power, the colonial master. Um, immediately before independence is handed to us, we begin to, to turn the guns on one another. And we haven't stopped doing that. Um, we had an opportunity on the eve of independence, immediately after independence, to reform um, the civil service, the judiciary, the, um, and we did that. Um, the civil service was gradually uh, indigenized because the civil service had a lot of expatriates who were gradually replaced. I think the last judicial officer, officer to leave Uganda, uh, that was non-Uganda, left in the 90s of later, it's Justice Porter. So we took, we took our time to create capacity in certain sectors, um, and we relied on those that we felt could do a better job over time. Politically, we didn't have that level of patience. We set about eliminating opposition very quickly and quite brutally as well. Laws that should have been repealed uh, were kept in, on the books and exploited to their maximum potential in some cases, and others were simply removed. So the freedoms that we could count on so we could speak 
we, the story is told. Um, the colonial governor quite often heading out to state functions would drive through places like Katwe and nobody would pay attention to them. The Kabaka would come out of the palace minutes later and the whole place would be literally lit on fire. Um, so freedoms that were guaranteed under, under colonialism were nowhere to be enjoyed by the Ugandan post-independence. That was us doing that. So for me, that is the great missed opportunity around what we could have done. Um, and, and I think maybe just to perhaps uh, throw a different perspective to Honorable Akena's uh, uh, postulation around, I mean, I agree entirely that the UPC did great work by all means, and it still stands today. So hospitals in places like Itojo, uh, places like Gombe that I know very well as a Muganda, as a Muslim, and they were built by the UPC, and they, they have a standard look and feel to them. And they were built by that first UPC Milton Obote government. And I think that is credit that mustn't be taken away, can never be taken away. However, the, the, quick, the way we quickly slipped into, into anarchy is, is what is disappointing. And specifically, the point where we, got, we get to a point where uh, our enemies are those that were closest to us. So for five years, the likes of uh, Balaki Kiria, David Lumo, George Magezi were languishing in Luzira, but those were core members of the UPC. Um, we had the common man's chat and the discussion around, uh, you know, that, that, and that was perhaps the politics of the time, one nation, one people, one party. So there was already a drive towards a one-party state in the first um, Obote government. I think that, was, that is my, my, my take on that. Um, should we throw the baby out of the bathwater? Absolutely not. Should we have a conversation as a nation, as a people? Absolutely, and I, I, do, I do agree with David. Where, where I found David's submission interesting was to begin by, by perhaps um, pointing out the naivety of the independence project and those that sponsored it to think that if they were gentlemen and they did the right things, that they would get the right outcomes. And, and I just wonder whether or not the expectation that we can actually have a conversation um, and get ourselves out of this uh, situation I find ourselves in is in fact itself um, something that will be practical for us to consider today, tomorrow, uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think uh, uh, one of the questions that we need to look into, uh, because it has been a defining one um, for the, in the history of this country, um, I know very well that whereas it, it, of course, was your parents who were at the forefront of these events, they still affect others among us. Our return to the 1966 uh, Mengo crisis, if you will, and um, I was just thinking as I looked over the panel that uh, two of the panelists um, uh, from parents who were more Republican, really, and the other two are uh, from people, from parents who are very much uh, loyalists of the Mengo establishment. So that brings me to the question, however your parents chose to go concerning that, uh, that situation that came to a, a, a head in 1966, how would you say that has affected you as a person? That the reason I'm going around, I really don't want to get um, to direct the question in, in, in directions that may be unpalatable. How do you think that has led to where you are as a person? I think that is quite apart from the overall uh, political uh, leaning that you have today. That inevitably has contributed to where we are. In other words, what is your take? Could things have been done differently? Uh, trying to look through the eyes of your father, maybe. Um, has that a bearing on where you are, Mr. Akena, as a person? I think this is one of the stickiest issues we have as a nation. Um, my brother, Morris, here covered it in that this was something which existed even before the independence. The way Morris captured it was, it was difficult for Buganda to accept a Mokopi to be above the Kabaka. And that was 
what was in place. In the display, there was an issue of um, the special status awarded to Buganda before independence. So, how was this matter to be addressed? On that particular issue, my late father, as he, he told us, was when they met with the Kabaka and the leadership in Mengo, which was actually organized by uh, Uthman's father, the meeting, that question was put to the UPC, uh, to the UPC president. And he said, we can actually find a formula around this. And the formula proposed was, after independence, we were going to amend the constitution and remove the queen and the colonial governor and replace them um, with a president elected by parliament and a proposed um, Kabaka Mutesa to be that president. But it did not go down well within UPC. There were many members of UPC who are not comfortable. Why are you proposing this one to bring the Kabaka? So there, there were issues which um, I think um, Dowdy captured this that all of the leaders had their, what I'd call their constituencies, which were pulling and pushing in different directions. So some of these unresolved um, questions came to the forefront. Um, so I really don't know. I mean, it's something which we have to be able to look at it as dispassionately as possible because it is what was in place, what happened. It could have been done differently, but we, we are not in a position to alter what was in place. Um, obviously, one of the sticky issues which my father had to d deal with, and the way he explained it, um, like the issue of the referendum of 64, which was put in that there should be a referendum to deal with the lost counties. When parliament enacted the law, it created a lot of um, disquiet. But then there was another law which was enacted where if the president did not sign into law, did not sign a, a particular bill, it can then fall under the prime minister, but there's a process to go through. And my father explained to me that when they passed that one, Kabaka Mutesa called him and he said, thank you. You have saved me because there's no way I can ever sign an inch of Buganda away. So the Kabaka had his people who would not allow him, whatever the case would happen, to allow any part of Buganda to get out of Buganda. You have a prime minister who also has a political constituency which are pushing in different directions. So it ended up coming to um, a collision, which is something which we are forced to deal with. And these are some of the unfinished business which the colonialists did not um, complete in that they left it to, to, to be played around. For example, in the 61 election, um, UPC won in Bunyoro very comfortably. But in 62, because UPC was now working with Buganda, Bunyoro now felt that these ones have now betrayed us and went in the opposite direction. But then later on with 64, after the 64 referendum and the way it was handled, so you, you, you have these ingredients and this is the country we have inherited. I, I want to go a little bit further back in that. Some of the issues which informed um, my late father was immediately upon independence, they found very difficult to run, to, run, to, to run the government. And this happened in that the whole colonial staff, majority of the colonial staff left. And he, he used to joke about it that even getting a letter typed was virtually impossible because most of the staff, the stenographers as they were called then and whatever, were expatriates and they left. So you come into an office and we did not have many Ugandans who had those qualifications. And therefore, that is what 
guided them on developing this manpower requirement policies, which they now started putting in place, looking at what was required. So even the issue of the 24 hospitals, you don't rush to build hospitals if you have not expanded your medical um, training facilities to train the doctors, train the nurses. So you had to start by training the doctors because it was a much longer period. Then you had to have the nurses in place and all of the technical aspect to make this to work. And that was now what was guiding on what we need um, as a country. And I think this is something which uh, um, David also touched on. We need to develop our own requirements as Uganda. The construct which we had, as I said in the beginning, was to support the colonial government. Now we need to put in place what is going to support Uganda and what is going to take Uganda forward. So do we have a shared vision? Are we able to transcend some of our historical um, realities? And it, it, it's something which we have to find a solution for. Um, Definitely, we find ourselves on different sides. It has um, created uh, other issues, but I think all of us on this panel here are children of Buganda. Much as I'm a Republican and one considered to be maybe um, whatever, but we do have to, and I, I also appreciate that these sort of conversations and this sort of um, putting this matter forward can help us get through this, but as a country for the future, we need to find ways of how we can get past this one and get a construct which works. Um, you can't wish away the kingdoms and also the reality of a republic is in place. I, I don't really see any politician removing the republic. So how do we coexist and make a Uganda which works for all of us? I think that that's where we need to go. Thank you, Mr. Akena. Uh, Ambassador Chiwanuka, your father was definitely a Republican uh, in his, that's my view anyway, uh, in his mindset. Did you internalize what he represented in terms of his political outlook? Has that had an effect on how you approach politics today? Uh, that's a, a very uh, tricky question, uh, which can put you in problems with the mango, especially I, who is uh, still not given up politics. Um, I was enjoying my brother's uh, talk, and then he stopped when he had not been told to keep quiet. He should have continued. <laughs> I was enjoying. You see. When the British came, they found that uh, Buganda was in a way developed. And they were calling us the Japanese of Africa. Because they found a system which was similar to theirs, deep in the hinterland. And you know, it was not at the cost. And it had a system similar to theirs. There were some models over there. And what the British did, actually, they, you know, they added more. I think they were following the Bible where our Lord said he was more will be given. And he who doesn't have even the little will be taken away. So you remember the president when he was talking yesterday. He said they never built schools outside. In fact, those schools there were built by Dr. Bote College. Dr. Bote started building these schools outside Buganda. All of these, the schools which were built outside there were built by the missionaries. Komboni College, what? The colonists did nothing there outside. They put everything here. So in a way, they gave the Buganda a kind of a special status, you know. And this was a problem. So they looked at the Buganda with a, not a, a very good eye. So in fact, when... Uh, uh, Dr. Bott was campaigning the 60s, early 60s. He said, when he went to Mbali, he said, give me, the, give me power, I destroy the Baganda. So, you know, he had that element. And these things were put on the newspapers. And then they told the Kabaka, look at what your friend is saying. You know, so the Kabaka said, no, he's just playing around. Who can touch us? You know, he didn't, you know, take the thing with the seriousness, it, you know, it, it deserved. So now, the, the, these problems were actually made by the British. In fact, I remember that the uh, Honorable has been talking about the lost counties. When they were in London Conference, I remember my father told the British, you are the ones who brought this problem. You let's solve it here. 
Let's solve it here and now. And then the bitch refused. And then Dr. Bode said, no, don't worry. When we reach, we are brothers. We shall sort it out. Eh, we shall sort it out. And for him, he knew what he was going to do. He said, this is to teach them a lesson. So, you know, that was, you know, a problem. So, now, uh, when you say your father was uh, a nationalist, you know, uh, uh, up to today, actually, uh, Mengo will never accept that. We never, it always has misgivings that they want the federal status, you know, the fat federal system. You know, I think my brother fears to talk about these things. Now, how, do, how does this thing, how will this thing be solved? Because the problem I, I foresee is that after President Museveni, one day, of course, a weak president will come to power. We shall not have a strong president like President Museveni. One day, a weak president will come to power. How is he going to address Mengo? Because, you know, now Mengo fears the President Museveni. You know, they just say, oh, let, 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 let him be. He will go. We shall, he will go. You see, it's a matter of time. Now, how do we go? He has been talking about uh, nationalism, how do we unite the country. He talked about it. But I think the most important point, I think, here is to address the Mengo question. It's, a, I, it's a very serious. It's, a very, it's only that now President Museveni is a strong man. They fear him. But when he goes, and it will be worse if a Muganda president comes to power, they will put pressure on him, and then the whole country can go on fire. So now, how do we address the Mengo factor? It is the more important, actually, to address first. Because, because it has a lot of problems. You know, this country you know, got problems because my father got a problem with the Kabaka, and they failed to agree. And that's where Dr. Bote got a chance. You know? And the rest is history. You see, so now you can see even now, when President Museveni gets a problem with the, with the Kabaka, you know, the country, there is uneasiness. Okay, see, someone will not, we say it's not as bad as the past, but you know, it's only that President Museveni is a strong man. But when a weak president comes, you will remember what I have said. You will see how the hard time they will give him. Now, so, my father was a nationalist, but the problem, you know, he was far ahead of his time, you know, far ahead of his time. And these people, Mengo, could not agree. He said, no, for us, we need a special status. You know, we need a special status. So the issue, uh, what our brothers are saying, I agree. I agree. We must be together. It is one nation. But how do we, you know, there are some things which we can hide, but well. And another issue, which uh, I'm sure... Uh, Dr. Bote, you know, brought, uh, added to the problems of the colonialists. Because uh, when he took power, he started going around creating hatred against the Baganda, making people hate the Baganda. It is there, my brother, only boy, don't deny that. So he incited, he, he, yeah, <laughs> he married the Baganda. But, you know, he, incited, he did not... He, he married the Muganda. He did not unite the country. Dr. Bate didn't help to unite the country. He persecuted the Baganda. He attacked the Rubiri. You know, he did all that. He abolished the kingdoms. Now, that doesn't, you know, help to unite. You see? So, how do... Now, when you are uniting the people, you must know that these are people who have kingdoms. They want their kingdoms. Now, how do we unite the country vis-a-vis -vis these people who want the kingdoms and they really they are very serious, you know. And they, they, so there is now a, a divide of the north and the south, which Dr. Bote created actually. So he created, you, you know, the army. For example, the army was full of northerners. And they tortured the people here, you know. So those memories are there, you know. So now, how do you remove these memories? When Mao was campaigning, he was saying, people were saying, but you are not jolly. You are not jolly. So what? They, 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 for, they, no, 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 you are jolly. So uh, Mao said, wait a bit. Mao said that I did not vote to be a Nacholi. So you see, these things are there. We, we have to address them. And lastly, you know, uh, uh, lastly, I, I want to, my brother here said about the that these missionaries, Mwanga killed the, the killed these boys because he was fighting this imperialism. Uh, there was a question that uh, 
which used to come in history, they were saying that uh, the coming of missionaries was an occasion, not the cause of colonialism. You know, whether missionaries had, would have come or not, colonialism would have come. So it's unfair to say that missionaries were forerunners of imperialism. Colonialism was, was coming, whether missionaries were there or not. I, I you not know, go deep into that. And when you say that uh, Mwanga kid, these boys, because of fighting imperialism, no, Mwanga, everybody knows, was a practicing homosexuality, and these boys refused. So he killed them because of that. So, yeah, now there is a Knock, knock. <laughs> yes, I think. Okay, since you are not comfortable with that, I will leave it. But. Uh, <laughs> Don't uh, ask me to substantiate, because if I substantiate, you know you not like it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> the long and the short, uh, where we started, was that the mango question, and you, you have uh, spoken quite ably about the, the fact that it, it, it happened to this country those many years ago, it still remains a potent issue, even today. We may paper over it, but it still continues somewhere in the background. That brings me to Mr. Mpanga. Your mother, uh, quite unlike uh, Mr. Kenner's father or uh, Mr. Ch uh, Chiwanuka's dad, were loyalists to the bone of the Mengo establishment, quite uh, just like uh, the late Abu Mayanja. My initial question was, those events touched on them in quite a different way from the family of the little body, for example. How has that had a bearing on where you are in political terms? It has a very strong bearing because, as I said in my initial submission, um, there are things that you imbibe just by virtue of being at home. Um, so let's deal with grandparents. Every other kid had a judge, a judge Amwami and a judge Amchala. Um, I didn't have on my mother's side a judge Amwami, and an explanation has to be given as to why I don't have a grandfather. So you get to know that your grandfather died, and you get to know that there was a clash or a, an attack at Luviri, and he died. And you start becoming curious how did he die? He was working, dedicated to duty, he was killed in the line of duty and the rest of it. So you, you, as a child, you do get to understand that your, your, your life, your outlook on life is very much determined by your parents, but we don't choose our parents. So it doesn't necessarily make me very right or very righteous in my view, which is why I was saying again that as an adult, you try to look at things from a slightly wider angle and understand that if I just continue to, perpetu to perpetuate, I think is the right word, to perpetuate a certain view without stopping to think and rationalize and understand why I have that view and why somebody else might have a different view, um, it may lead us into a, a perpetual spiral of conflict um, where one can't forgive another because one feels peren perennially wronged and cannot see that there might be an opportunity to stop this and move, move forward. Which brings me very quickly to um, you know, my brother, Honorable Kajimu's submissions. One, I, I, don't, I, I, I serve in the kingdom of Uganda, and I do not believe that there is a Uganda question. Um, how we frame things determines how we analyze them and how we might solve them or not. Buganda was established hundreds of years ago. It exists. It has a language, a culture. It gives you so many of the norms, or it gives me, the Buganda, the norms and the basic things that I need as a human being to exist. Um, I imbibed those from my home. My father was Attorney General of Buganda. My mother was uh, the daughter of the Mukuru Orovidi. Um, stood, by the way, went to Legico against a, Buga a Mengo boycott, but that's a different thing. That's the independent streak in my mother. Um, and when I was at school in England, in university in England, I suffered what was my first very uh, overt and oppressive incidence of racism. It made me really question who I was. 
And I started, you know, trying to understand this thing of, you know, why, who am I? I'd never really questioned who I am. But every time I said I'm a Ugandan, I was given this, oh, so how's Idi Amin? And I say, well, Idi Amin uh, was deposed in 1979. This was 1989 or thereabouts. It's like, all right, um, what else was known about Uganda? Oh, you, you've, you've got problems with AIDS, yeah? Um, so what defined Ugandanness was AIDS, Amin, war, um, and things like that. Now, I'm not going to say I needed to define myself based on how other people perceived me. And the story of how I resolved that uh, is largely irrelevant here. What's relevant is this, was that I drilled down, and when you really drill down to the bottom of what you need as a human being, um, Uganda doesn't give you. Buganda does, Nkore does, Acholi does, Lugbara does, because we were communities, we existed before the construct of Uganda. So if you say there's a Buganda question, it takes as a given Uganda, which was created just the other day, its boundaries were not settled, by the time my father was born, I think it's bound, Uganda's boundaries were finally settled in 1933. Is that right? 36? 30, sorry? 1926. My father was born in 1925. All right? My late father was born in 1925. So Uganda's boundaries, just the other day, could put you in Kenya, or in Uganda, in Congo, or in Uganda, in South Sudan, or in Uganda, because somebody was randomly playing with a pen and things, I don't know. We really don't know how that thing worked. But we know how our communities, or at least we have common myths which we believe in, and we choose to believe in each of our communities. Now, the difficulty that there was that ended up flaring up in 1966 in Buganda was flaring up, we've got a very lovely, uh, a good display here, was flaring up in Renzururu from the 60s all the way down to uh, the, the, the 80s and has come up again uh, recently, um, has flared up from time to time in different parts in different ways, is how do these communities live within this enforced but artificial construct? So it's not a Buganda question, it's a Uganda question. It's a Uganda question. And the nationalists who wear this label with a lot of pride and I, you know, I'm, I'm happy for you, don't answer this question. Why has this Uganda caused suffering everywhere? You talk about the northern soldiers killing Baganda. Go to the north. What was happening between 1986 and 2007? You see? So if I don't understand that when I go to northern Uganda, the story is going to be different. It's the same thing. It's Uganda causing discomfort and problems for everyone. And if people were trying to resolve this thing in the 60s by saying, all right, if we can't understand A, B, C, D of how Uganda is going to be run, then leave us to run this part of ourselves. That's what federalism was about. Leave us to run this bit about ourselves. They were immediately demonized, called all sorts of names, uh, Federo, Mengo, Click, etc., etc. All those things were really just a reaction to the bigger structural problem that I was talking about. If we don't recognize it as that, then unfortunately, we condemn the grandchildren of independence to come here on another panel and tell another story of how they suffered and, you know, it's the same thing, we go round and round in circles. So federalism might be one of a number of key ways of ensuring that there is a division or distribution of the essential goods and a determination of how one lives one's life within these communities that were found in Uganda, in this area that was then named Uganda. Um, the model suggested by one community may not necessarily suit all the communities, but we need to discuss and agree amongst those communities how we resolve this question of Uganda. Otherwise, Uganda remains a very vicious animal which has eaten each one, bitten each one of our members of our families here, has shaped how each one of us has grown up. And um, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 52 and we have on my own, you know, like many people do, uh, a WhatsApp group for, uh, for, for, for my year group in, in, in a particular school. Um, and just recently, a friend of ours, there's one chap who kept coming on and then, you know, some people, some, somebody posts a picture of uh, a bloody accident and he drops off and then, and, you know, we, 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 he, he kept having to, to deal with this issue. Then eventually he started a conversation about trauma. And I remember telling my wife, actually, that we have a lot of unrecognized 
an untreated trauma amongst the general population. Why? Because of Uganda. It's not a Buganda question. It's Uganda. You go to Kasese, it's there. You go to Gulu, it's there. You go to West Nile, it's there. You go to you know, Luero, it's there. It resides in every part of Uganda. Why? Because we've come to terms, nationalists have told us, that this animal eats people. Just be on the right side of it and let it eat the other ones. Then it goes and eats those guys, hey, I told you. Then it comes, and then the day after tomorrow, you know, it's eating NUP guys now. It's eating, it just eats people. We need to stop it from doing that. We need to tame it and make it work for us. And to my mind, that's the critical thing, um, that if any judgment is to be made, and again, you know, now let me jump in to, you know, to defend the children. J Jimmy didn't elect to be the son of, he could, you know, born in 67, he could have been the son of, you know, anybody. Uh, you didn't choose to be the son of anybody. I didn't choose, neither did uh, Uthman. Um, but we found ourselves where we found ourselves. Our responsibility is, in my view, to ensure that the grandchildren don't have to deal with this issue. Let them deal with the issues that are important, the bread and butter issues, the issues of wealth creation, the issues of, but let there be givens that, you know, op being an op opposed to a certain idea does not endanger your life. We didn't talk about that and why many of us are not in active politics. When you choose an active political line, you start getting whispers. Your wife, your mother, your mother-in-law. So say, hey, Daudi, are you sure? You, know, you never know these things. Why don't you just remain in law? You know, that kind of, it's just true. Um, you start getting, you know, we need to remove that thing. And to my mind, that's a conversation that we should have. Um, if we learn anything out of 66, was that the fire didn't end in the Lubiri. The fire spread across the country. Nobody was spared by that fire. The fire went into the region. Kony ended up in uh, Central African Republic um, and you know, via DRC. Um, all these countries have had some kind of reverberation of the violence that came from here, whether it be in the form of refugees, whether it be in the form of conflict, whether it be in the form of you know, all sorts of you know, construction, lack of development. Think about all the children who are not vaccinated because there's been war in one part of the country or other. Those kids died because of war. Um, we need to change that politics. And to my mind, it's the, it's the construct that is causing us this problem that we need to address very urgently. Um, and that's, you know, in my mind, 66 makes me think that nobody should have to deal with violence as a result of politics. I think that's a critical thing that we need, and we need to find a way of living together. Thank you. Thank you. And as we uh, start our journey towards the end of this discussion, uh, Mr. Mayanja, kindly give us your perspective on that same question. Um, very tough to, to add to David's submission. Um, you know, for me, there, there's a famous quote that my father used once, which was to say, that ultimately democracy lies not in the constitution, but in the hearts and minds of the people. Um, and and, and what, what we've been, what David is talking about, as we've been told how to be democratic. We've been told that it's backward to want to be monarchist or otherwise be loyal to your tribe or other, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and you simply cannot do that. You cannot make people love what they don't love. You cannot make them hate what they love. Um, so I think that's part of the conversation. Um, historically speaking, however, it's also important to just distinguish between so-called Mengo and Baganda and the Kabaka. The three are not the same. We are not the same in the 60s, they are not the same now. Um, and, and there's been um, this whole um, misconception and lumping everything together of just a Mengo, Mengo, Mengo. Um, and that, that's, that's perhaps part of the misunderstanding of what it is that makes the, the Buganda uh, sort of const construct. Um, and I, I can't agree more that as a nation we failed to deal with that. Um, the reasons why we failed to deal with that um, um, back in, you know, 60 years ago, 55 years ago, um, today we're still making the same arguments about Buganda and about uh, discussions around federalism. And I think it's the, the passage of time should allow us to have a more sober conversation about these matters. Um, 
I've, I've had the opportunity to read some writings from those that were uh, more mature at the time and observed events of the days from outside of Buganda. And, and I think the, the way in which Buganda was perceived outside, outside of Buganda, within Uganda, um, is a challenge, was a challenge then, and remains a challenge to this day. Um, for me, the interesting question is, how different would things have been had the attack on the palace not happened? Because we had a, a federal dispensation that was favored Buganda by all means, uh, but it did exist nonetheless. How, things, how would things have been different? How different would have been the trajectory for Uganda had we not had that confrontation? Um, and I'm not quite so sure that we would necessarily have failed to do the things that the, UPC, the government of the day did elsewhere in Uganda, for example. Um, because that fight, that struggle was not about necessarily resource allocation. It wasn't about electing who represents you. It wasn't about representation of people in, in political office and public affairs. Those are not the issues that were thought about. Um, and we've also seen the rest of Uganda take on a very Buganda model in some respects. Uh, there is hardly a region in Uganda today, uh, save for, for one, that does not have a recognized cultural leader. Even those that did not have a, a history of kings have gone on to, to, to select or elect or otherwise put in place positions very similar to kingship. Um, so that, that, that matter then speaks to, uh, to David's point to say that we need to have this, uh, this discussion as a nation. Uh, countries like Nigeria went for a federal approach um, and, and, and nobody has ever come up to suggest that the problems in Nigeria are caused by the federal government that they have, for example. Um, so for me, to answer the question more directly, I, I, I certainly subscribe to the view, uh, if you ask me personally, I uh, subscribe to the view that um, we, we need to, that, that this construct we have at the moment, the so-called republic, um, isn't working for all of us. Um, and even th for those that might say it's working, are simply sitting on, on suppressed issues uh, in those regions um, that will have to be addressed one day. Will, be, will we be ready to have that conversation about who we want to be, how we want to be governed, and so on and so forth when the time comes? Um, I think we'll, we might equally find ourselves in the same situation we found ourselves in 1959, 60, 61, on the eve of independence, trying to resolve issues that we had sat on uh, for quite some time. So again, um, that, that is my direct answer to the question, um, but certainly uh, th these are, I agree that these are issues that we, we want to address with, with, with honesty, with, with candidness, and with, uh, um, with mutual respect, and, and, and let's have a conversation that, is, that, that actually allows us to move, to move forward um, as, as a country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, even as we conclude today's discussion, I think for me, there have been a number of uh, sobering points that have come to the fore. But what I found most interesting is that these are the children of their parents indeed. <laughs> they, they, they very much still think along the same lines of their fathers. It may be that they are not expressing them in exactly the same way in terms of uh, the political uh, leanings that their fathers or mothers lived on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether they be in business, they still retain the same thinking. And I think that is a result of uh, having really appreciated what led to the lives that their fathers and mothers lived, uh, the lives of sacrifice, uh, the lives of um, really selflessness in a way. Uh, that era had its own interpretation of what leadership was all about. Their children are still echoing what they hoped uh, Uganda might become someday. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this, this panel discussion. Excuse me. Sorry, madam. Thank you for your time and attention.
Sorry, if I may just make a small appeal on behalf of the children of politicians, um, past and especially present, the children, um, to all that may listen and to whom this message may come. Um, one of the most oppressive things for the children of politicians is the number of guests who come home and who don't leave. <laughs> they come for a very long time, every day, you know, Monday to Monday. Give politicians an opportunity to spend some time with their families um, and give their, you know, let their homes be sanct sanctities. Is that the right? Sanctuaries, sorry. Sanctuaries, at least for Sunday afternoon. Just give them some time. Every single day, there's somebody with some issue um, daily. It really, really interrupts the life of children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you very much, the panelists. We recognize the presence of the managing director, UBC. Thank you very much for the support. And uh, another applause to the panelists, and to Rachel. But without taking your time, I want to request the representative of the minister to come and say a final word because uh, we are closing the, the panel discussions, but we still have the exhibition running up to the end of December and we continue calling upon the public to visit the museum uh, to see their history and to learn more. You're most welcome, Director. Our distinguished panelists, all our visitors in various capacities, you're most welcome. I'm not as privileged as uh, my friends here on the left, but I must confess that it was a very interesting discussion. Let's give them a round of applause. I studied science at the university, but I was here yesterday, and I heard this president spoke, quoting history from 14-something, talking about <laughs> And then this gentleman talking, I, I think I'm reconsidering to learn something about history is really, really very interesting. Uh, my name is Basil Ajer. I'm the Director for Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities. I stand here to represent the uh, leadership of the ministry. I want to thank you so much for sacrificing your time for this very important event. And most importantly, the people providing information. It started yesterday and we are moving through the journey. We want to identify with our history. We want to bring history closer, where we come from, our common identity, so that we are able to shape where we are going. That's the reason you see us doing Uganda at 60, and it's an exhibition of the nation's history. This is very important. And now, the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife, and Antiquities, just for quick information, has three departments. That's the Department of, 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 of of tourism development, as a department of wildlife conservation, and as a department of museum, and that is where the antiquities come. Somebody was wondering, we are talking about Ministry of Tourism. So we are talking about the cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible. So your presence here is very important. <laughs> and, and as a country, you are helping us build the product of tourism. Because you don't need to talk about only the, the nature, going to the national park, going to mountains. Culture is part of the tourism product. And as you talk and bring us information, we are building on the products. Because this country, we know that uh, before COVID, tourism, we attracted 1.5 million visitors who are coming from outside Uganda. This sharply dropped to about 400,000 in 2020. The sector of tourism generated 1.6 billion US dollars, which again quickly dropped down. So we are trying to stimulate domestic tourism by first appreciating what we are. Countries like Egypt depend so much on their culture, the pharaoh, the pyramid, you know. So if we can build our history and develop products around culture, 
encourage Ugandans to come and appreciate what we have, the rich heritage that we have. That is very important. However, we have a duty to shape the future positively. A lot could have happened before, but we don't need to stick on a negative you know, line of argument. If we can collectively turn the history, build a positive heritage, that will be very important. Allow me to use this opportunity to thank all the people that worked with us to put this together. First and foremost, UBC, which was actually very instrumental. I want to thank Makere University that worked with us very closely. We thank so much uh, Michigan University that worked closely with us. And finally, Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities. Don't forget that the museum is part of the, the, of, of, of the ministry. So you need to come here and appreciate what happens in the museum. With those few words, I thank you so much. And I declare this panel discussion closed. Then ask you for time to enjoy the exhibition which is taking place. We are going here up December. So get time tomorrow when you're free or the other day and then enjoy what is taking place here. Thank you so much. Our session is closed. Bye. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, I request the panelists. Uh, we are a hospitality industry. And so you can't live here without taking coffee with us. And so we have uh, coffee at Ivamba restaurant. Uh, I request uh, Sebunya, please guide our guests. UBC, you're part of the guests now, please. Um, the curators, please join the guests. Our director will uh, be happy to continue discussing with you as you enjoy the coffee. Madam Rachel, please join the coffee, join the director to have coffee at Ibamba. Thank you very much.